Hi, I'm Carly Kloss. I'm going to show you guys how to make a website using Wix.com. It's so easy. Nope. Hi, um, my name is Tim and I am uh, 29 years old and I feel compelled to make like a video book report about a book that I read. Um, I've done this once before a couple years ago. I read a book about the Black Panthers and I just talked into my uh, computer's camera and now years later I am speaking into my cell phone's camera because I think that the visuals will be better. Clearly I don't, clearly I'm not a tech guy. Uh, but I thought I would reintroduce myself to the booktube uh, universe. Um, and uh, so the book that I read, I guess we'll just jump right in DIY style. I read, uh, I have both versions. I read the paperback version and this is the hardcover version of City on Fire by Garth Risk Hallberg. Um, and I like this book a lot and I have a lot to say about it, but um, for people who might not like immediately know me or who have not read the book, uh, I want to start off with like a, a too long, didn't watch uh, introductory segment, I guess, about like spoiler free for what the book is about, um, if that's cool with you. Because uh, I, I, I saw a couple of reviews uh, of the book already on YouTube, but I didn't think that they kind of had the... Um, they weren't like the discussion that I kind of want to have about this book, even though I'm just going to kind of ramble and talk about what I liked about it. Um, I think I'm going to go a little bit more like in depth uh, and later on give like some vague spoilers. Um, but oh, with two minutes in, we should just jump right in right away. Okay. And I have my notes all prepared. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I like this book a lot and... Uh, um, this book is one of the things, it's one of those things that finds you at like, uh, for me, it was one of the things that found me just at the right point in my life. Um, the prologue, just like the first page and a half, um, really blew my hair back. Uh, and I'm going to link to a PDF, uh, in the description for anyone who wants to read it, uh, to read it. Um, but there are three sentences in it that really hit me hard. Uh, and when I finished the book, it felt like their full meaning kind of was like newly ingrained in me, um, in some way. Uh, and I want to quickly read them just cause they cut right to the heart of the book. Um, and they were kind of like the idea that all my thoughts had centered around for like two months, uh, the two months that I had read the book. Um, uh, so the narrator is just talking about how different the book is set in New York City and he's talking about how different New York is now uh, than um, how it was in uh, 76, 77 uh, when most of the book is set. Uh, so he says, Oddly though, what this rationalizing of every last desire tends to do, the muchness of this current city's muchness, is remind you that what you really hunger for is nothing you're going to find out there. What I've personally been hungering for since I arrived six weeks ago is for my head to feel a certain way. At the time, I couldn't have put the feeling into words, but now I think it is something like the sense that things might still at any moment change. Um, so like I said, this book found me at a time in my life when I was kind of relearning that everything important is invisible. Um, I saw that written, everything important is invisible on like a mural uh, in my neighborhood. Um, and as I kept reading the book, I, I started it in August, uh, basically took September off um, and finished it the first couple days of October. Um, but as I was reading it, I kept seeing mirrors of my own life in it. Not in the situations uh, in it, but more in like uh, the sentences and the feelings of uh, the characters. Some of them describing good stuff, some of them describing bad stuff, but all centered on this idea that like the work of life is keeping the people and the stuff that we love in front of us um, in spite of all you know the shitty distractions that there are uh, in life. Um, and that's what the book is kind of about Basically, you know, part of it portrays uh, the New York punk scene, and I think of 
uh, the title of Searching for Former Clarity by Against Me, like, this book reminded me that there is no former clarity. Um, and that the work of life is, that that work of life is worth it. Uh, and, and, you know, just at the reader-writer level, like it says in the prologue, like, this book definitely made my head feel a certain way. Um, and if you take nothing away, nothing else away from this nonsense, um, I hope that's it. Because I just, I just feel compelled to tell you about it. Uh, but okay, but so in real terms, uh, City on Fire is like a fat, this is like a 900 page book, it's a fat, you know, big fat literary novel, um, uh, saying um, way too many times, about the, all the requisite themes of like American fiction. Love and family, money, uh, freedom and individuality and revolution, uh, the impression of racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, and growing up, too. Uh, there are a couple characters that are teenagers in the book. Uh, but if this is in your warehouse, if this is in your warehouse, like, it's, if you're into, like, big, fat, character-driven, decade-spanning literary fiction, uh, you'll probably dig this. Um, it's set mostly in 1976 and 1977 uh, during New York's fiscal crisis. If you're not familiar with the city or its history, it was on the brink of bankruptcy at the time. Uh, and if you're watching, if you're uh, a David Simon guy, if you're watching The Deuce on HBO right now, which is set a little earlier in like 71, the city is dirty. Um, very unlike the New York City um, that we may know today. You know, the glitz and glamour of the Upper West and East Sides is still there, but places like downtown, the village, um, Brooklyn, these places, they're not ghost towns, but they're uh, you know, I mean, all the stories that we hear about, like, the beat poets and uh, you know, the early punk scene and the drugs and the mob and the prostitution and, uh, like, all that stuff, yeah, all that stuff is happening at this time. And it's all, yeah, I was just going to say it's all true, but um, that's all happening at this time. It's just very different New York from what the New York I live in now. Uh, and those are kind of the sort of the range of conditions that the characters find themselves in. Um, and the other thing that I wanted, there's like 12 or so major characters, uh, you know, living in this time period in New York City. And, but I would also say that the main character is New York City, New York, like the New York that's a composite of all the, uh, major characters. Uh, that version of the city, um, is what brings them all together. Uh, plot-wise though, what brings them together, uh, the plot line of the book, I'll get into that, is like, it's basically like a red herring murder mystery. Uh, someone gets shot in Central Park on New Year's Eve, and everyone is involved in some tangential way. Um, and it brings together the Hamilton Sweeney family, focusing on an estranged brother and sister, uh, William and Regan uh, Hamilton Sweeney, and William's boyfriend Mercer, and uh, um, Regan's husband, uh, Keith. Um, it also goes into squatters uh, in, in a punk house who dabble in arson uh, in the village. Um, two Long Island teenagers who are seduced by the punk scene. I think that's actually the jacket copy, seduced by the downtown punk scene. Uh, who are Sam and Charlie, those are the teenagers. Uh, there's a magazine reporter, um, an art dealer's assistant, uh, a cop um, who's stricken with polio and close to retirement who's solving the murder mystery. There are a lot of characters which I love. Um, there's a lot of background, back, uh, backstories, and interludes. And uh, it's told through, uh, as you might imagine, I feel like most literary fiction is told through like third person, limited not omniscient, which is, uh, there, there's no use of the I in the, the chapters. The chapters are all short, but they're all told through a certain character, but also through that third person uh, lens. So, uh, there's a blurb on the in the paperback edition that says Hallberg is like a cross between J.D. Salinger, Tom Wolfe, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, although I, I read a quote from him saying that this book is kind of the start of him. Uh, he wants to be Don DeLillo when he's 80 years old, like everybody. Uh, but I, I don't think that this book gives off like a made-for vibe. I think any reader can find something to identify with. But, and I, I think it comes from a genuine place, but if those names ring out uh, to you, I don't think they ring out to everybody, but if they ring out to you, that's definitely the kind of book 
uh, that this is. And the last introduction. <sighs> Part two. Not enough storage on my phone for one full take. This is gonna be such a mess. But I, I need to get it out. This is too good of a book. And I think the background of the book is awesome. So less introductory piece. Okay, so um, so the book publisher Knopf publishes City on Fire in the fall of 2015. Um, and the fall, like September, October, is uh, when like all the capital B big books, um, and most of them are released. Um, and uh, at the time, Holberg is kind of like a relative uh, unknown um, in my estimation. He has published a novella of pictures of 63 pictures and vignettes um, and some short fiction and some criticism. Uh, but he's a younger guy too. So th like this book comes out when he's like 37, 38. Um, and from interviews that I've read, he says that he like, he grew up in uh, North, like a small town in North Carolina. Both of his parents were uh, teachers. Uh, and into his teen years, he kind of gets involved in the North Carolina and Washington DC punk scenes. Um, you know, being like an angry young man, uh, driving around the backwoods of California, smoking pot, you know, ranting and raving with his friends, listening to Patti Smith. Um, he's a big fixture, not only in the New York punk scene, but in the book as well. Uh, so I guess he's like a Patti Smith fanboy. Um, he comes to New York into his 20s, I assume, for shows, uh, and in 2003, uh, trip to the city in 2003, um, most of the idea for the novel apparently comes to him in like a 90-second, white-hot, inspirational fit. Um, and in 2007, when he's 28 years old, he's teaching at Hofstra University's uh, Lincoln Center location and Fordham University in the Bronx. Um, I assume as like an adjunct, so probably just barely scraping by financially, but he's married and I guess his life is otherwise stable um, and he starts, he starts writing the book uh, over three years um, by hand. Uh, and in the middle of that, he has a kid uh, as well. Um, and it, he says that he was convinced it was unpublishable and that it was just, he, it, he felt compelled to write it. Like it was just, you know, calling his name, I guess, like they say. Um, and, and that it was just a joy to do. Uh, I was fascinated to hear that and I'm fascinated, I was fascinated with his editing process. Um, so I just wanna make sure that I have it right. So he writes, uh, there are I think seven parts, seven books in this book. But anyway, so he writes like, he wrote like uh, part one and then he edited it and then he moved on to part two. But before he edited part two, he edited part one again and then part two. And then he did that as the book went on. So he wrote part seven, then he edited part one, two, three, four, five, and six again. Um, and I, pff, that took him another, uh, so the first draft took him three years, took him three years, and then the final draft took him another three, and then he did the once over with his editor um, at Knopf. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, Diana Tejerina Miller, but apologies uh, if, I spell, if I pronounced your name wrong, uh, Diana. Um, but anyway, so he writes the book, and then somewhere along the line, he's at a wedding. Um, and he's seated at the same table as Chris Paris Lamb. And Chris Paris Lamb is like a big, uh, he, he became like a big literary agent when he sold um, The Art of Fielding by Chad Harbach. Uh, uh, the Art of Fielding was like a really important book in publishing around like 2009, just coming out of like the, um, the mortgage crisis. It kind of got people excited about books again. Um, and this City on Fire was published along the same lines, at least in the publishing industry. Uh, so, but so he's seated at the same table, they're, they're seated at the same table, and Holberg asks uh, Chris, he goes, um, he, he just asks him apparently what he would do with a thousand page novel. And uh, Chris says, well, why don't you just tell me about the book? Um, I imagine he gets told about the book and then he takes him on uh, as an agent. Or as a, yeah, as his agent. Um, and then they hold an auction for the book and uh, Knopf wins the auction for between one and two million dollars. I've read different numbers and different uh, accounts, but a lot of the press I've seen about the book and read about the book mentions the, the financial 
uh, aspect pretty early on. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with book publishing, like one to two million dollars is an extreme amount of money uh, for an advance um, uh, for for any novelist, but a debut novelist especially with like you know nine hundred thousand page manuscript that just like doesn't happen. Um, celebrities and presidents get big time money for books. Five to ten million dollars isn't unheard of, but for literary fiction, it's that like turns heads. Um, to his credit, though, he, he said that he doesn't, he tries not to think about it because it's transactional and not a good set of thoughts when you're sitting down to write. So, uh, more power to him. I hope he sticks around because I, you know, like I said, I like the book uh, quite a bit. Uh, getting down to it, so the, apparently all the editors who got a copy of this book or of the manuscript loved it and he was hyped up significantly. And Knopf worked hard to sell this book and it shows. Um, Chip Kidd, probably the most uh, well-known jacket designer or art designer in the business, uh, made the cover and the cover of the fanzine, which I'll get, which I'll, I'll show right here. That's the cover of the fanzine. And uh, just a co total shout out to Chip Kidd and Maggie Henders, who um, drew up the fan. Maggie did uh, most of the fanzine's regular artwork. This book is just phenomenal. Uh, the, the way that it's presented felt feels really unique, and uh, I was just a really big fan. Um, but it just felt really sophisticated. Uh, okay, so he was at BEA and ALA. I'm sure all the conferences. You know, his New York event was at the Strand. Um, Michiko Kakatani at the Times wrote his review. Um, I mention all of this kind of for not, uh, because I want to make the point that whether, like, the New York literati thinks that, uh, what did I write down? Uh, whether or not this book was the success, the success the New York literary, the New York literati like wanted it to be, uh, which I have an opinion, that's, that's kind of irrelevant to, uh, the importance of this book to readers. Um, like, I don't know, I, th I think context is everything, but I wanted to kind of balance out a lot of the half-hearted reviews of this book that I've read, like, oh, it's not... You know, it could be shorter, you know, all that kind of bullshit. Like, you, readers should be able to decide that, not some blowhard critic. Um, oh my god, I just wrote this talk for like 15 minutes of an introduction. Jesus Christ. So what did I love about City on Fire? Um, I definitely want to get into some spoilers, so I want to, like, if you're still watching this, uh, sorry. Or maybe you've read it before and you're super into it. I don't know. Um, okay. So I, I love, I love, I love the dialogue right away in this book. I hear it right away when Mercer and William are having their fight uh, about, you know, they buy a Christmas tree on Christmas Eve, I think, and they, they bicker about, you know, how it fits or doesn't fit in the apartment. Um, uh, I love the way that when they exchange gifts, the narrator says, uh, William gets a coat and the narrator is like, uh, you know, the, the disappointment that you, you know you're disappointed when someone, or you know someone is disappointed when they say what the gift is. Like, you know, you open a book and you're like, oh, it's a book. And I, I thought, I thought that was awesome. Uh, I feel like the story of the, the boy hanging out with the more experienced woman um, is like a kind of a trope that's getting a little bit more play um, than it was, than it did when I was younger in, in fiction maybe, but um, Hallberg puts like a, like a 70s spin on Charlie and Sam, which I think is really cute and and cool. They go through, like, Charlie's... Uh, they His points about music are really well taken. He, like, charts um, Charlie's interest in David Bowie, and then subsequently in the punk scene when, like, Sam introduces him to, um, to punk, and, like, he puts on the headphones at the record store, and he, like, initially he thinks that there's something wrong with the headphones, but the line is, like... When the instruments lock up and the chanting starts, like you could tell that it was a style. Um, and I, I like you, there are a lot of movies about punk rock and a lot of documentaries about it that I think get it wrong. That I, like even over the past two years, like I've I've been thinking more and more. Um, I'm a big music fan and a big punk fan in particular, but a lot of the '70s. A lot of the '70s punk scene is like I'm not sure how attractive it would be uh, to people who were into punk now, because punk was, it was like the last time that rock and roll was a revolutionary force, it feels like to me, and, like, it was dangerous, 
like in the seventies. Like I, I, I hate to say like you would get beat up, but I mean that's not what I mean. I mean like they were all, you know, they were all junkies, you know, and like alcoholics. And I mean the music was fantastic. And like if I was a little kid, maybe I would hear the Ramones and still think they were fantastic. But uh, it. it his portrait of the punk scene is just very genuine, it feels like. It feels like it was real. It doesn't feel like it was sugar-coated or made to be something that it wasn't. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. But I, I've never seen that in fiction. And it's rare that I hear... Uh, that I hear people talk about it, you know, and not saying, like, Oh, you weren't there, you don't know, and, like, all that kind of bullshit. Um... But I thought the teenage aspect of the book was fantastic. Um, I thought it was so adorable when they're like he and it's recounting how he and Sam became friends and they're doing they're dropping acid or something and he's like uh, the narrator's like holy shit he could see her feelings. I thought that was awesome. Uh, uh, when we meet Reagan or Regan and Keith and uh, Regan Regan has that line about uh, success in America being like method acting. Um, you were given a single defined problem to work through and if you were good enough in your role you managed to convince yourself of its, the problem's, significance. Um, I want to say that uh, there, I've read a lot of um, comparisons from this book to like Bonfire of the Vanities uh, and I want to say that I see that but I think those comparisons are a little uh, superficial. Keith is definitely uh, Definitely comparable to Sherman from Bonfire of the Vanities, but, uh, what did I write here? Um, like, he, he, uh, he has the attractive person's indifference to his own attractiveness, and the, the way that he's described as being, like, he's learning about finance, and, uh, there's a line like, most of the world's great ideas can be written on a cocktail napkin, and Keith was a cocktail napkin kind of guy. I uh, thought that was really good characterization. Um, and Regan has a couple of my favorite sentences in the book. Um, I'm not going to recount them here, but the one, it's on page, I think I wrote down it was on page like 73 or something, but when she cuts her thumb, uh, like, I don't know, pink, red mixed with water became pink in the glass or some, some crazy sentence that was just very nicely worded. Um, but, and when she's picking up her kids at day camp later on in the book or dropping her kids off at day camp, how stressed out she is reasons I won't get into without that scene that chapter was really good um, I saw she she and she's one of the top three characters in the book for me um, I imagine her as like the woman in the big short I don't know if you've seen the big short but there's one of the like women who works at Goldman Sachs that's who I imagine Regan is uh, Holberg's prose sometimes has like a timeliness to it and not in tone or sentence structure but like when he um, uh, like William and Mercer, uh, Mercer is William's boyfriend. I, I don't know if I said that, but they they get into that fight in chapter one, and then in chapter four, uh, we meet William again, and the first sentence is, you know, "But what had he been doing there to begin with?" And then it goes on to this list of questions, and then it's like, soon enough, William Hamilton Sweeney would have cause to revisit these questions. Um, it's super, he, like the comparison to F. Scott Fitzgerald is super spot on. Like it, his prose flows like that, but it, I don't know, the timeliness, uh, know, the way that it reflects time really stuck out to me. At the end, uh, Mercer has a revelation and he, he says, um, uh, the, the line is, ah, so there it is. Mercer is no longer unaware of the essential predicament. He has discovered its exact dimensions. Uh, I just think, I don't know. The, the evolution of the book, the evolution of the characters of the book is reflected through the prose, and I thought that was really awesome. Uh, like everybody else, I like a good villain. Uh, Amory Gould, man, this guy. Fuck this guy. Uh, before I get into him, though, I actually want to register a criticism. Um, he doesn't just... Amory and his sister Felicia Gould are not uh, described as Jewish. I imagine they are because of their name. But between them and uh, Charlie, whose last name is Weisbarger. He's an adopted, red-headed Jewish kid. Uh, and he kind of has a crisis of religion between Judaism and Christianity. And I'd just be interested to know what like Jewish readers thought about that, both with the crisis of religion and then the main villain of the book being um, you know, a maniacal Jewish uh, businessman. Who is, who is an asshole. I, I don't want to, there's not like, I don't get like anti-Semitism vibe, but I'd just be interested to know what uh, Jewish readers thought. 
Um, but rather than go into what the what the book says uh, or implies that he does, uh, I, just the way that he ropes Keith into high finance is so funny to me. Where he where he's like, "Have you thought about banking, my boy? Investing?" Like I just hear it. And when he's trying to make his run to head the Hamilton Sweeney Company, uh, the way that he's described as um, he has a bland face, but he looks like he's, t he's tugging at both ends of a pen, uh, like he wants to exact revenge on it. And just those descriptions, I think, are just so, like from a writing standpoint, that really, really impressed me. Um, and also the link between him and the Dulleses. Like they say that he was friends with the Dulleses. He worked in government, so he worked with Alan and whatever the other Dulles brother's name was, who were like the head of the CIA. Um, that really made me laugh. Uh, he's described as having white hair. I pictured him as like the bad guy in Despicable Me, which I've never seen, so I hope that guy is the bad guy. But the guy that Steve Carell plays, I think, that's who I imagine uh, Amory Gould is. The tragic center of this story, man, Richard Groskopf, this poor guy. I imagine him as like a less cool, like Greg Palast. Um, he's the other similarity to Bonfire of the Vanities, like having a magazine reporter, you know, uh, you know, document some stuff. But man, he digs himself a hole and just gets lost, beating around the bush of it. One of the most unique suicides in fiction that I know of. Spoiler alert, but his suicide I thought was awesome. Uh, a couple sidelines. I really liked Bruno, I hope I'm pronouncing this name right, Augenblick's definition of an artist. Uh, someone who combines a desperate need to be understood with the fiercest love of privacy. thought that was a cool sentence. And the line about fame when uh, actually Richard is introduced about how winning awards is basically meaningless, but how you want to experience some kind of meaninglessness from the inside. thought that was really cool. That rang true to life. And when... Uh, Here's another spoiler. When Keith is having sex with Sam in the dorm room for the first time, uh, at the end of some paragraph, it's yeah, it's just the funniest line. He's like, uh, the the miracle. He's he wanted to be in a dorm room. The miracles of coeducation, all you could possibly want, and all it took was your soul. I just thought that was so funny. Oh dear God! One final take. So sorry. Where was I? Uh, Mercer, Mercer coming to uh, New York and realizing that um, New York is the people and not just a place. I thought that was so touching and just it, so real. Um, and while we're at it, the, the way that uh, Mercer and Jenny get together during the blackout, I mean, Mercer and Regan are hilarious, but Mercer and Jenny, it, it, like pure comedy. I, I fucking, I love that. Um, uh, yeah, Mercer again, also a top three character, uh, when he hangs out, like I said, with Regan cutting, uh, cutting, uh, her thumb, uh, and just Mercer, Mercer is, so Mercer is gay, black, um, he's a school teacher, um, and I just thought Hallberg wrote that really, really well, um, you know, I mean, all, all his influences, you know, the great, you know, dead white guys of, you know, the past two centuries, um, but he, he he writes for gay black characters, I thought, pretty well. Uh, so that points to him for that. Um, like I said, I think I, I went over this already. The descriptions of punk and the posthumanists. The posthumanists are like the uh, uh, like the revolutionary cell that kind of lives in this punk house in the village. Um, there, there's no like manifesto, but the way that Nikki Chaos kind of describes posthumanism to Charlie, I thought it was really uh, genuine. Uh, I don't want to get into like the politics of it, but the anti-establishment feeling that punk kind of, uh, that was, um, uh, that punk didn't start it, that was kind of infused into punk, I guess, from the beginning is uh, spot on, I, I felt, you know, from, you know, from me, who's living in 2017. Uh, just thought that was really cool. I thought the chapter where um, Charlie joins the posthumanists, where it's like, how you skip school is, you lie. How you develop revolutionary consciousness is how every paragraph starts that way. I thought that was really, that was very, very punk, very cool. Um, the cop humor, when we get to our boy Pulaski, who's, who's a cop who's close to retirement, um, who's stricken with polio, who uses crutches, um, uh, who, who that he con consistently referred to as a cripple. Um, uh, I thought the, the humor where he gets kind of like chewed out by his bosses was really good because the um, the murder in Central Park becomes front page news like a couple months later when the person 
uh, becomes 18 years old and her name gets like released to the press. Uh, when he gets chewed out by his boss, is just fucking hilarious. Um, you know, reminded me, you know, I, there have been wire comparisons, but it definitely reminded me of like McNulty getting like his ass chewed by uh, walls or you know, something like that. Really, really good. Um, the when William does uh, William has done heroin before, I think, but when um, they describe like his first time doing uh, heroin, how he's descending into an arm, he's descending arm first into an arm temperature bath. And uh, I thought that was a really good description of how heroin probably hits you when you shoot it and how by the end of his, he's uh, in the middle of his first nod and how he's listening to music and it says that he crawled inside the speaker. Uh, that's the last sentence of the chapter. I thought that was beautiful. Uh, the fireworks motif, uh, the cover of the book is, fire, is, you know, fireworks. I don't know if you can see. But um, fireworks by uh, uh, a role um, plot-wise. Uh, I won't get into that, but um, I thought the motif of fireworks and how they're a symbol throughout the book, uh, there's a line in, I think, Rich, one of Richard's manuscripts that says that uh, fireworks were music made visible. And I thought that was a perfect way to merge uh, like the musical aspect and the firework you know, aspect. I thought that was just really, really well written. Um, uh, something that a lot, I think a lot of people will bring up is how long, well, I mean, we I've brought up how long the book is, but I think the, the shortest book in the book, the shortest section, is called Three Kinds of Despair, um, and it goes into three backstories uh, for a couple of the characters, but I just want to say, like, a lot of the backstories are, people are like, oh, you can cut 400 pages from this book. A lot of the backstories are set up pretty early. Like, in Chapter 10, they talk about Block Island, and the Block Island chapter is a couple chapters after that, but... I, I, don't know, I, I don't think there's much to cut from this book. I think a lot of the rewards, like, one of the interludes is, like, a letter from the patriarch of the family to William, and he reads it, like, toward the end of the book, finally, and it's just, like, oh, I, I, very rewarding experience. I thought, I didn't think there was much to cut in this book. I just want to um, get that out there. Uh, the Blackout is the last section of the book, so the New York City Blackout is where the whole thing culminates. Um... Uh, everyone's lives change. It it was not as frantic as I thought it was going to be. It was very well paced. Um, it just didn't feel as you know fast as I thought it would be. I love that they link. Spoiler alert! I love that they link that he linked Sam's death with the finding of the bomb. Uh, I thought that was beautiful. Uh, William talking to his father, uh, like kind of having all these revelations, and his father being asleep. I, I saw that coming, but I thought it was just. Just awesome. And I loved, I loved the open endings of this book. Pulaski and SG. Oh my God. Um, uh, Nikki, Nikki getting away and Amory being in the airport and you find out about the cigarette burns. I just, I had to read that a few times, but I was like, oh man. I, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like you'd have to read that part. Um, finally, I want to get to some criticisms. Uh, I, I talked about a few already, but one that I want to talk about is there are some... Now, I don't think like going to the dictionary every so often in, uh, in a book is a bad thing. I don't think I went more than a few times, but there were words in here that I thought were pretty... Like, she uses the word soporific, and I, like that's it's like to clean like yourself, I think. I don't know. Some, some of the words I thought were a little too... Like, you didn't need to use such big words. Uh, I, I want to get back to the, the fans. Well, we went over the fans, you know, Rick. I don't want to waste too much more time. But I want to say also that the David Foster Wallace influence is obvious. Uh, he he like there's a record review in the fanzine of a song called like the Howling Phantods. That's an Infinite Jest reference. Um, I thought Will's interludes. Will is the son in the book, the son of Keith and Regan, and he writes. He's the writer of the prologue, the post. He's writing the novel. He wrote the prologue and the postscript. I thought the his uh, psych psychologist like interlude I thought that was so awesome so awesome I, I just you know like it comes off as nonfiction, and I thought it was just so well written I just I don't know it just felt so modern and true I, you know just for lack of a better word I was gonna do like a top sentences in the book thing but this is already so long um maybe that's another video like cool sentences in books. I don't know. 
Things that I didn't understand at first, I didn't get the Andrew West conclusion. I had to read about that on Goodreads, sorry. Uh, Andrew West is cool, but I didn't get like, I don't want to spoil that. I didn't get that ending and I didn't, I noticed that the bird's motif was kind of a thing, but I didn't, uh, I didn't realize what the bird thing meant about how it's like linked to the bomb and the man in like Richard's manuscript about how birds follow the scent of nitrate or something. Didn't understand that, had to go to Goodreads. Uh, and, you know, well, I'll, I'll end it there. Uh, this is a cool book. He, I just really respect the idea that, like, the or the belief that the novel can teach you a little something about everything. Um, and that he said something really cool about New York in an interview. He said that New York is the city for everybody who doesn't belong anywhere else. Um, that's how I feel about it. Uh, and I... I I never heard it described that way, but I thought that was a really good description of New York. Um, and, and the last scene, I'm a total music nerd, uh, and I want to express myself fully. So I want to, I, I was just was so stoked to read a book that like involved, that was like highbrow literary fiction with that like talked about like punk rock and, uh, the camera? I don't know. Some of the records that, like, I thought, like, if you're really into this book and you want to get into, like, the punk scene um, of, the, of the 70s, maybe some stuff you can check out that I have here for you. Um, so 1977, this is the second Ramones album, probably the one that was out when this book was getting, or this book was set. So first, the second Ramones album, Leave Home. Uh, underrated, I, one of the classics, but I think it's the most underrated of the first four. Uh, Patti Smith, uh, so Horses is the one that's mentioned in the book, but I'm a Radio Ethiopia guy. Her second album, too. Uh, the Dictators, mentioned in the fanzine. This is Go Girl Crazy, kind of like a pre-punk uh, New York thing. Blondie, I actually saw Blondie. Um, and I was reading, the, I brought the book to the show, actually. Uh, and Debbie Harry, Blondie, still have it. Really, really good show. This is Plastic Letters, their second record. I think I'm doing all second records. Television, I'm more of an adventure guy. I think The Fire is their best song. Talking Heads, 77. Um, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. This is the lost mixes of the Like a Motherfucker album. Because the first, the, you, the album sounds like shit. I don't want to get into the history of that. But Heartbreakers, kind of underrated. Not so much unknown, but... Uh, good rock and roll band, bunch of junkies. Sad story, but music was good. Richard Hell and the Voidoids, Love Comes in Spurs, Blank Generation, Classic, Dead Boys, Young Lad and Snotty. Um, and I would be remiss, uh, something else, the last thing, last thing I really liked is that uh, he mentioned some Australian bands. I only know The Saints, but now I have to check out like Radio Birdman and there's another Australian reference in there. But I would also be remiss if I didn't talk, if I didn't say you should check out the LA punk stuff from the 70s. This is a Danger House collection the Avengers from the East Bay, the Dills, the Weirdos, X, uh, the Bags, the Skulls, the Weirdo, the Weirdos, you know, whatever, the Screamers. A lot of the LA stuff gets kind of kind of gets the shaft when it comes to like, you know, the English and the New York stuff. Um, but LA punk was cool too. And this book, this book was fantastic. Oh my God, this is like a half hour video. Jesus Christ. I felt compelled to make this video. This book is really good. I needed to get this out of me. Um, if you read the book, did you like it? If, you know, are you interested in the book? If you do want to read it now, even though I spoiled some shit for you, I don't know. Um, what time is it? It's 10.07. This took about, this took about an hour. All right. All right. Thank you guys for watching. If you watched, um, keep reading. Uh, freedom, autonomy, equity, self-determination, Peace forever.